Hi, welcome to Skip's Corner, where I cover Nashville's baseball history and events and introduce you to players, coaches, and other fans. As a baseball fan, you know that there have been seven players inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in the 2022 ballot, and they include Boston Red Sox star David Ortiz, Dodgers star Gil Hodges, Minnesota Twins pitcher Jim Cott, uh, all around played so many games. Uh, Minnie Minosa played, uh, was a great Cuban player, played in the Caribbean leagues and also played for the White Sox and other teams. Tony Oliva, another batting champ from the Minnesota Twins. Buck O'Neill, who was the voice of Negro Leagues baseball for a long time when it wasn't really recognized. You may remember him from Ken Burns' film on baseball. And then Bud Fowler. And I'll talk a little bit about these later, but I thought it would be interesting to go through the roster of the Baseball Hall of Fame members and see if I could find a Nashville connection. And I found a lot of them. There are 340, I think, after this latest round. And I, I think I found about 50, 60. I didn't really count them up all the way, but I think there's about that many that have some connection to Nashville. And some of them are a bit of a stretch, but I think you'll enjoy listening to some of those who played here or had some connection to Nashville baseball. One of everybody's favorite players is Henry Aaron. And I was doing some research on him because I found a connection in the newspaper, in a Memphis newspaper, that Henry Aaron, who was playing for the Indianapolis Clown as a rookie, 18 years old, would be playing in Nashville in the first game of the first regular season game of the Indianapolis Clowns Negro Leagues season. So I did a little more research about it. It happened on May the 11th, 1952, and the newspaper account goes like this. Indianapolis Clowns sensation, 18-year-old rookie shortstop, Hank Aaron, plays in his first regular season game as a professional at Sulphur Dale. The Clowns win both games of the doubleheader over the Philadelphia Stars, 5-2 to two and 2-1. Two to one. Remember, this is in Sulphur Dale and there were 1,800 fans on hand. His Negro Leagues experience would only last 14 games before he signed with the Boston Braves and was sent to Eau Claire, Wisconsin, to begin his career in organized baseball. Now, I think at the end of the season, the Braves let him go back to the Clowns who were in a Negro Leagues playoffs. But I want to go through some of these other names. There's Hank Aaron. These are in alphabetical order, I think. The second one is Louis Aparicio, who was a great Chicago White Sox, Baltimore Orioles infielder. He was inducted in 1984, and his connection to Nashville was he played for the Memphis Chicks and would have played many games at Sulphur Dell. And once I asked Larry Taylor, an infielder with the Nashville Vols who passed away recently, who is the best player he ever saw in all of his years in playing? He only played in the minors. And he was quick to respond, Louis Aparicio, he could do anything. So that's a pretty good testament. Larry was a great guy, and he loved his baseball, and obviously he loved Louis Aparicio. And then there's Harold Baines. Now, that's kind of a surprise. He was selected in 2019, which may have been a little bit, bit of a surprise in its own right, but in 1978, he was a 19-year-old, and he played in his second season for the Knoxville Sox. So they would have played games at Greer Stadium against the Nashville Sounds because that was the first year of the Sounds' existence. Yogi Berra was selected in 1972 and played several games here with the Yankees and also came back as a coach when the Yankees and the Sounds squared off during those years that the Sounds had an affiliation with New York. Roy Campanella played here many times with the Dodgers in exhibition games, but he also played in spring training. Tom Wilson, who owned the Baltimore Elite Giants, would open the season here in Nashville. And so Campanella often played here, but played at Sulphur Dale. Ray Dandridge was selected in 1987, a great Negro Leagues player. He played for the Nashville Eli Giants in, I think, 1943. And he came back in 1950 as a member of the Minneapolis Millers, and the newspapers said it was the first integrated team to play a game at Sulphur Dale. Ray Dandridge was playing for the Minneapolis Millers. Bill Dickey was selected in 1954, a catcher for the New York Yankees. His number eight was retired, and then Yogi Berra came along and was wearing number eight, and they retired his number when he retired. So there are two number eights retired for the New York Yankees. So Dickey played here, as as did Joe DiMaggio. Uh, He was selected in 1955. He played here in exhibition games. Leo DeRocher was selected in 1954. That's the season he brought the New York Giants here as manager to play an exhibition game against the Cleveland Indians. In fact, in that game, Daryl Spencer was hit by a pitch. 
by Cleveland's Mike Garcia, hit him right in the face. And I've got a picture of Leo DeRoster yelling up to the press box to call for an ambulance. It looked that bad. Bob Feller pitched here. He was selected in 1962. He brought a couple of traveling teams here, barnstorming teams here at the end of the season. Frankie Frisch played for St. Louis, 1947 selection. Lou Gehrig, once again with the Yankees teams that came here in exhibition games, he was selected in 1939. Josh Gibson was selected in 1972, a great Negro Leagues player. Jeannie McBride told me once that he saw Josh Gibson hit two home runs at Sulphurdale, both of them over the left center field wall, and he said they were two of the longest home runs he had ever seen. Warren Giles is a member of the Hall of Fame, but he does not have a connection here except his son, Bill, was the man- general manager of the Nashville Vols trying to resurrect that team in the early 60s. Lefty Gomez pitched here a couple of times. I know he pitched in the 1926 game that the Yankees played when they came to visit an exhibition series. And he also came back a couple of times as the speaker for the Nashville Old Timers Baseball Association. Maybe the one other time where we've had two speakers and everybody loved him. Ken Griffey Jr., and I'll rely on Mickey Hyder, who runs the Old Timers Baseball Complex at Shelby Park Number 1 in Mickey Hyder Field at Old Shelby Park Number 2, who says that Ken Griffey Jr. came here as a traveling team player and hit a home run at Sulphurdale. So that's one thing that Mickey likes to talk about, some of the players who played there. But Gabby Hartnett was a catcher for the Nashville Vols back in the early 20s. He was a selected in 1955 to the Hall of Fame. And Trevor Hoffman in 2018, a lot of people don't remember, he had a short stint with the Nashville Sounds as a pitcher. Wade Hoyt in 1969 was selected to the Hall of Fame. And Wade Hoyt was a pitcher with the New York Yankees, and he pitched one season here, I think in 1921. But he's most famous for being an announcer for the Cincinnati Reds, where during rain delays, he would talk about his time with the New York Yankees, mostly about Babe Ruth. Everybody loved to hear his stories. Reggie Jackson came here and played, uh, selected in 1993, played for the Yankees in an exhibition game for the New York Yankees. Walter Johnson pitched in a game here. He was selected in 1936. He was one of the first ones selected, along with Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb and others. Harmon Killebrew was selected in 1984. Now, he played for the Chattanooga Lookout, so he would have played a couple of games here, well, several games here, 1957 and 1958. He was a great guy. He came to our old-timers banquet once, and I handed him a baseball and asked him if he would sign it. He had the best autograph clear. He would tell me that he told other players to take pride in your autograph. If someone asks you for it, they will, you know, give them something to be proud of that they can show, and then you can be proud of. And he signed that baseball for me, and I said, I don't know if you saw it or not, but that ball is a Southern Association ball, which obviously was old, and they didn't make them anymore. I'd purchased it somewhere. And he said, here, let me see that. He took it back and he wrote underneath his name, Chattanooga Lookouts, 1957-58. So there's not too many of those balls around with a Southern Association baseball with an autograph like that and that inscription on it. Kai Kai Kyler was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1968. He was a player for the Nashville Vols and a good one, played the outfield heels, ended up playing for Pittsburgh and the Chicago Cubs, and was manager of the Atlanta Crackers for a while, too, I believe, maybe even Chattanooga. Famous sports writer, sports editor of the Nashville Banner, Fred Russell, loved him and took credit for giving him his nickname, Kai Kai, because he said in one game there was a ball hit to the outfield where Kai Kai Collar was playing, and the infielders were yelling, Kai, Kai, for who's got it, Kai, Kai. And so he wrote about it as Kai Kai Collar, and that name stuck, and he was always known. His real name was Hazen, Hazen Kyler. So he was called Kai Kai Collar, is known as Kai Kai Collar. Tony La Russa, now the Chicago White Sox manager in 1978, Harold Baines was on that team. He was the manager of the Knoxville Sox, so would have been managing games here in Nashville at Greer Stadium. And the next season, they called him up from the minors, from the Southern League, to become the Chicago White Sox manager. And he's managed many years, and now he's back again as White Sox manager. Barry Larkin, a great shortstop with the Cincinnati Reds, was selected in 2012. I think he came down to Nashville on a rehab assignment and maybe batted 14 times or just played in a few games during that rehab. Tommy Lasorda was selected in 1997, the great manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers, and he pitched in a game in the for the Dodgers against the Milwaukee Braves in 1955, maybe pitched an inning. Lee McPhail. Now, Lee McPhail is an executive elected to the Hall of Fame in 1998. And his connection to Nashville is he was born here. His father, Larry, 
managed a department store. And his dad became general manager of the New York Yankees and the Brooklyn Dodgers. And his son, Lee, became American League president. And they're the only one, father and son, uh, members of the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Mickey Mantle played here with some Yankee teams. He was selected in 1974. Eddie Matthews was selected in 1978. Matthews is the only player to wear a Braves uniform while the club was in three cities, Boston, Milwaukee, and in Atlanta. Then there's Christy Matheson. Christy Matheson was a great pitcher, Hall of Fame pitcher, selected in 1936, a member of that original crew that was selected. And he pitched here for the New York Giants. Joe McCarthy was manager of the New York Yankees, 1957 selection to the Hall of Fame. He managed those clubs that came here for exhibition games in the 50s. John McGraw was selected in 1937. He was the Giants manager for Christy Matthewson. And everybody loves Satchel Paige, who was selected in 1971. People still talk about him and how many games he must have pitched and how many pitches he must have thrown. He played for the Nashville Elite Giants was signed for the National League like Giants when uh, Tom Wilson got him from the Birmingham Black Barons as they were facing financial difficulty. And he thought he could do a better job of drawing if he moved the team to Cleveland. He renamed them the Cubs. It didn't last very long. And when he returned the team back to Nashville, Satchel Page said his contract was up and he went away. He never pitched again for Nashville, but he pitched in Nashville many times. The last time that I know was in 1962 when he brought Goose Tatum for an exhibition game for a team called the Harlem Stars. Pee Wee Reese and Phil Rizzuto. Reese in 1984 and Phil Rizzuto in 1994 both would have played exhibition games for the Dodgers and the Yankees, respectively. Babe Ruth and it was selected in 1936, that original class of inductees, and he played here several times beginning in the early 20s. Hit a home run in 1927 in an exhibition game in the newly turned around Sulphur Dell. Duke Snyder in 1980, also for the Dodgers. Turkey Stearns, Selected in 2000, a great Negro Leagues star, played for the Detroit Stars and the Chicago American Giants. And his connection is he was born in Nashville. He went to Pearl High School and was a great player, a great home run slugger. Casey Stengel was selected in 1966, was mostly a manager of the New York Yankees, but also the Mets, and played in one of those games in 1927 when the Sulphurdale had been turned around. He was the manager of the Toledo Mud Hens, and he bragged to the sports writers that once he played a game here and he dragged a bunt down the first baseline and it went over the short right field fence for a home run. That's the way Casey Stingle liked to tell stories. Joe Tinker was selected in 1946, was part of that great infield of the Chicago Cubs who came here and played in the early 1900s. Rube Waddell also selected in 1946. My grandfather was a Waddell and he has told had told many times that we were related, but I've never found the connection. Rube Waddell came here as early as the 1890s and played for the Detroit Wolverines and many other times, too. I think a couple of those Detroit games were against Vanderbilt. Honus Wagner was selected in that original class in 1936. Junie McBride told me once that he slid down the ice chute to get into the ballpark to see the Pittsburgh Pirates play. And he walked in, and the first person he saw was Honus Wagner. Honus Wagner, of course, famous player, Hall of Famer, known for that baseball card that's so rare, the Gretzky card, threw him a glove and a ball and said, here, let's warm up. And he, and he said, I, I remember how big his hands were. And Jenny said, one thing I didn't remember was to ask him to sign a baseball for me. He always wished he'd have had that prized possession. Hoyt Wilhelm, selected in 1985, wore a uniform for the Nashville Sounds as a pitching coach for a while. And then J.L. Wilkinson and was selected in 2006. Now, Wilkinson owned the Kansas City Monarchs. He was one of the white players of the Negro Leagues teams. And in 1931, he came up with this idea to play games at night. And he invented this traveling lighting system. And he brought it to Tom Wilson's park in 1931. Played, I think, two night games during the the early part of the season. Now, let's go back to the original group that I mentioned earlier who have just been inducted. I can't find anything on David Ortiz. I can't find anything on Minnie Minoso, Tony Oliva or Buck O'Neill that they actually played here. I can't even find that Buck O'Neill was a manager when the Kansas City Monarchs played here, but it's very possible. But Gil Hodges, Gil Hodges came here several times. Gil Hodges came here on April the 5th, 1953 with the Brooklyn Dodgers, but he didn't get to play in the game. He was having some feet issues. Then on April the 4th, 1954, 
He struck out as a pinch hitter for Dixie Walker. On April 4th, 1955, once again, he did not play. He was having some back issues. But on April the 8th, 1956, the Brooklyn Dodgers beat the Milwaukee Braves by a score of 12 to 2 before an overflow crowd of, get this, 11,933. And Gil Hodges hit a tremendous home run uh, as the Dodgers collected 17 hits in the win. He also added a single to go along with his homer and had two RBI and scored twice. Now, that's a little nondescript. We know what a great player he was, but I want to tell you something about Jim Cott that was a special, special thing to happen. He was a member of the Chattanooga Lookout. And on May the 16th, 1959, at Sulphur Dell, he whiffed 19 Nashville batters to tie the league record set by Glenn Thompson of Atlanta in 1954. He got 14 vols on swinging third strikes, and he struck out the side in the seventh and eighth inning, and Nashville outfielder Chico Alvarez struck out five times. Now, that's a pretty special feat for what turns out to be a Hall of Famer. Now, I want to go back to Bud Fowler, because Bud Fowler, it was an interesting man. He lived near Cooperstown, New York, of all places. And because of the lack of integration, segregation was rampant. He could play sometimes. Some He played for some white teams, and then he would go to a city, and they would say, we're not playing if you're going to play a black player. It was a sad time. But I want to read to you March 31, 1896, out of the Cincinnati Inquirer, because I had found a reference earlier that he had some connection to Nashville, and this is it. Paper reads, Muncie, Indiana, is to have a team this season on a par with the celebrated Cuban Giants and the Page Fence Giants. Now, Fowler had founded the Page Fence Giants just, I think, a couple of years before. Bud Fowler, the veteran colored second baseman, has secured a team of colored players to represent this enterprising little Indiana city. Mr. A. L. Shunfield, an enterprising merchant of that city, has furnished the means to make it possible for manager Fowler to carry out his plans. The Muncie team will play under the name of the Londons. Now get this, the players are all graduates of Fisk University of Nashville, Tennessee, and they are now at that point getting into condition for the season's campaign. Mr. A.L. Seanfield is now in the city and is particularly anxious to arrange games with teams in the Inquirer League. He would like to meet the managers of the Shamrocks, Manhattans, Cincinnati Gyms, Campaignsville Blues, and the Navies at Hawley's at from 2 to 3 o'clock this afternoon. He was in talking about being in Muncie, Indiana. But the other newspaper accounts that I have all say that Fowler was in Nashville to recruit players. Now, he, it didn't last very long, so I don't know the reason. And that's kind of one of those things that's out there that we may never know the answer to because he went on and played for several other teams in his career. He ended up in New Mexico and Canada and all over the place because he couldn't find a place to play. Well, that's my take on Hall of Fame for Nashville, the connections to Nashville. There are probably others, and I'll try to find those too, and I'll share those with you as I go along. As always, thanks for listening in. If you'd like to send me a note, write to me at 262downright at gmail.com. I really appreciate you listening in, and I hope you'll come back again soon. Thank you.